Greetings, everybody, and welcome to the UEA Christmas Lectures. My name is Dr. Tom Lysance, and I teach history here at the university. And for those of you who don't know, a university is a place you can come to to continue your studies after you leave school. Just think about that. Leaving school and getting to do more work. Study history even more. So if you come here and study history, you might be fortunate or unfortunate enough to be taught by me. Now, I need to let you into a secret about history, which is that history is actually a form of time travel. They don't tell you this at school, but when you get to university level, the more you study history, the more you immerse yourself in the past, the better you get at stepping back in time, at seeing things through the eyes of people who lived hundreds of years ago, at immersing yourself in a totally different world. And because of permissions and regulations and all those sorts of things, I need to ask you before we begin today, are you willing to come back in time with me? Only about 150 years. We're talking about 1866 on a journey of the imagination to a Victorian Christmas time 150 years ago. And I just need to ask you that, if that's all right. So who's ready to come back in time this morning? Anyone? Yes? Oh, good. Just to warn you, one or two of you might get your hands a little bit dirty, but we shan't worry too much about that at this stage. Well, there is Queen Victoria, and we're now back in the middle of Queen Victoria's very long reign. In fact, the day is the 24th of December. It's Christmas Eve. Snow is softly falling outside in the mild winter sunshine. Decorations are being hung on the tree. The stockings are over the fireplace with the mistletoe, awaiting presents from, well, you know who. And the children are already beginning to feel around with their presents to see what might be inside. It was the Victorians who invented most of the things we most love about Christmas time. The Victorians invented, well, Christmas trees for a start. Christmas trees were brought over to England by Victoria's husband, Albert. And the royal family brought over the first Christmas tree. So the Victorians brought Christmas trees into our lives. They also invented Christmas cards. Here you can see three different Victorian Christmas cards. One over there depicting, well, you know who. One in the middle showing the Christmas tree and the family gathered around it. And one over here showing Christmas cards being delivered Fancy that, a Christmas card depicting a Christmas card. Well, the Victorians did love their Christmas cards, and they also invented things like Christmas crackers. Another invention, well, of course, it wasn't quite an invention of the Victorians. They didn't invent snow, but they did like the tradition of throwing snowballs at each other. Now, I hope none of you throw snowballs too hard at each other, especially not at mum and dad and other family members, because they can hurt. But the Victorians love their snowballs and their snowmen, and here are a couple more Victorian Christmas cards showing those things. And the Victorians were very keen on the Yule log. Here are some children bringing home a Yule log. Now, does anyone here know what a Yule log was? Anyone know what a Yule log was? Did you have your hand up there, right at the back? No. <laughs> no one here knows what a Yule log was. Yes. Well, sometimes it was a yew tree, yes, sometimes. But yule is an old-fashioned word meaning Christmas. So it's a Christmas log of some, of some sort. Does anyone know what you do with it? Yes. Absolutely right. You burn it over the 12 days of Christmas. The log had to be large enough to be burning for the whole 12 days of Christmas. Top marks over there. And thanks for your contribution down here. Now, the Victorians also had some stranger objects at Christmas, including these little dolls. They're not much larger, well, probably your thumb, actually, rather than mine. These are tiny. There's one close up. And these little dolls were known as frozen charlottes because they were very stiff, very rigid, almost like they were frozen. Now, this is a trickier question, but these little dolls are brought out at Christmas time. And can anybody guess what they were used for? Yes. Um, 
to play with Mary and Joseph in the nativity. I think they probably were sometimes used for that. Yes, I think probably, but it wasn't their main use. Any other guesses? Oh, yes, there at the front. A little toy you play with. Well, certainly the children did play with them, but before they played with them, something else happened to them. Over at the back there. Put them on the Christmas tree. Ah, now, I think occasionally people did put them on the Christmas tree, and I'll come to that in a moment. But it had another use, yes. In Christmas crackers, oh, I love that idea. As far as we know, they weren't put on Christmas crackers. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what they were used for. They were used for putting in cakes. They were used for hiding in cakes or putting on top of cakes. So when you ate your Christmas cake, you had to be really careful not to crunch one of them, or you had to pick them off the top of the Christmas cake. And of course, they love Christmas cakes uh, in the Victorian times, and their Christmas pudding, and all of these sorts of things. Now, there is one very important part of Christmas, and I've already sort of hinted at this, that the Victorians didn't invent. Does anyone have any guesses as to what the Victorians didn't invent. Yes. Santa, absolutely right. Santa Claus was not invented, of course, by the Victorians. Santa Claus has always been around. Now, Santa Claus, also known as Father Christmas or Saint Nicholas, was a subject of growing interest in Victorian times. In Victorian times, there were more and more sightings of Santa Claus being recorded. Some of you might know a famous poem describing how the father of a household stayed up one night after the children had gone to bed and managed to see Santa Claus. It's called A Visit from St. Nicholas. Does anyone know this poem? I see a few hands going up, and it begins like this. And I'm going to read out the first few lines, and if you want to repeat it with me, you are welcome to do so. "'Twas the night before Christmas, when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. And a few lines later, we discover that the father sees St. Nicholas arriving with his reindeer and he climbs down the chimney and we are told he was all dressed in fur from his head to his foot and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. Ashes and soot, of course, because he's been climbing down all those chimneys. Now, in those days, Santa could only be glimpsed by candlelight or perhaps by the light of the fire. And because the Victorians didn't ever get a good look at him, they weren't quite sure what he looked like. So here are some Victorian depictions of Santa Claus, where, as you can see, some of them thought he wore blue, and some of them thought he wore white, and some of them thought he wore red. Now, life could be very hard in Victorian times. Not all children had nice, comfortable houses. Not all children had presents to unwrap. Not all children got to enjoy Christmas. Even on Christmas Eve, and you've got to remember we are now the 24th of December, 1866, Christmas Eve, even on Christmas Eve, when Santa was going down those chimneys, some children were forced to go up chimneys. This is a Victorian chimney sweep. He's no older than you are. And his job all year round was to climb up chimneys in the cities with a big brush and a ladder and sweep out all that soot which had accumulated on the inside of the chimney from all the coal fires that were being burnt for people to keep warm. It wasn't much fun, and the person teaching him here doesn't look particularly sympathetic. But in order just to earn a crust of bread, some children had to do these sorts of jobs in Victorian times every day. Now, it wasn't only going up chimneys and getting covered in soot that children did. Some children would go down to the river foreshore when it was low tide, and they would wallow around ankle deep in freezing cold mud, trying to find things that they could sell. The Victorians were very good at reusing and recycling things, and in Victorian times, everything had a use. So if they managed to find an old bone or a piece of rag 
or better still, perhaps a coin someone had lost, they could go and sell those to special traders who dealt in such things and earn a living. They were known as mudlarks because they went down in the mud and they were up with the lark first thing in the morning. And these are some drawings of Victorian mudlarks from the book written by Henry Mayhew. So some children were going up chimneys on Christmas Eve. Other children had to go down in the freezing mud and pick around for bits and pieces. And other children went to the outskirts of town and scavenged through great rubbish heaps. Now, has anyone here been scavenging through a rubbish heap? A couple of you. Excellent. OK, well, you can join my team. Would anyone here like to go rummaging through a rubbish heap? What, really? On Christmas Eve? Oh, OK, well, I'm glad that you've all got your careers sorted out. On Christmas Eve in 1866, some children went to the dust heaps, as they were called, and would start sieving through to see what they could find that had been thrown away in people's rubbish. Here we see a late Victorian photograph of women sorting through the rubbish, and you can see there's lots of old paper there and scraps of cloth, and they're putting it all in these large wicker baskets. There's a man in the background raking over it, and it seems like they're having a good time. They're chatting with each other. And here we see another Victorian illustration of a dust yard, as they were known, with more women sieving through the dust. And in the foreground, you can see some of those children. Now, they're not working at the moment. They're probably on their lunch break. They're playing with the dog. Can you also see the animals there? The animals would go along to the dust yards, too, and root around for anything they could find. So the pig is probably looking for mouldy old turnips and other delicious things like that. And the geese will be pecking around, pecking around for juicy worms. And the dog is probably looking for old bones. And actually, you can see there's a little pile of bones down there in the foreground that the man might have put to one side for the dog. Or at least the dog wants to get a bone. So these were the dust yards of Victorian England. Now, you might be wondering, why is it called a dust yard? Why not a rubbish heap? Well, in Victorian times, there was no central heating. So people had to keep warm by burning coal. And they burnt coal day in, day out, all the time, creating lots and lots of coal dust, which then had to be collected and carried away. Here is the dust man, Victorian illustrations of the, of the dust man. And he would go around the city crying out, dust hole, with his basket. And whenever people heard that, they would bring out, what would they bring out? Dust? What would they keep it in? In a dustbin. <coughs> Absolutely. A dustbin. Because the Victorians also invented dustbins. So all this dust is accumulating and being carried off to the dust yard in these sorts of carts. And do you know something? In Victorian times, 90% of rubbish by weight is dust. So there's an awful lot of dust you have to sift through. I better just put this lid back on there because there's a, quite a bad smell coming out of that dustbin. Now, it wasn't only dust that went in to the dustbin. All sorts of other things were mingled in with the dust and sort of mixed together. So these children, when they were going through the dust in 1866, they might come across a broken cup or maybe a smelly old sock or a rotten fish or even a mouldy apple. And it might be that some of those things were useful to them and could be resold, but other things weren't. Now, who here is looking forward to a nice Christmas dinner? Put your hand up. You're looking forward... That's quite a lot of you. That's quite a lot of you. You, sir, you're looking forward to a nice Christmas dinner down here at the front. Yes, I'm pointing at you, sir. Yes, you, yes, yes. What are you looking forward to most? Turkey. Turkey. Okay, thank you. Who's looking forward to turkey? Excellent. Who, who's looking forward to gravy? Oh, yes, you all like gravy. What about Brussels sprouts? <laughs> Only in Norwich. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. 
Okay, now, of course, you've got to remember, this is very important, that we have now travelled back in time 150 years, and it's the year 1866. So I'm afraid that some of you children, if you want a nice Christmas dinner, you're going to have to go rummaging through the dustbin to, to find some things you can sell, because otherwise you won't get to eat at Christmas time. We're going to do a little experiment, therefore, to see what the Victorians threw away and to see what they recycled. And it will involve perhaps getting your hands a little bit dirty, and you might encounter a few unpleasant things. I need a scavenger. I need a scavenger volunteer. Oh, oh it's so hard. Um, I need a scavenger. You, sir, will you be a scavenger? Yes. Please come down to the front. Excellent. Now, you mustn't look in there yet. I'm just going to give you some equipment. Better put those on. I think you also need an overall because you might get covered in soot. So there's your overall. And will that fit you? How's that? You look like that chimney sweep. Excellent. What's your name, by the way? Jamie. Jamie. Great. Good to have you on board, Jamie. Now, Jamie can't do the scavenging on his own, of course. We also need some tradespeople. It's almost like you're going to guess what I'm saying next. We, we also need some tradespeople to assist him because he's got to sell the things he finds to people. So, thank you, Emily. Emily's our scavenger assistant. They didn't have assistants in Victorian times, but we're brushing over that. Scavenger, so I need six tradespeople. Okay, um, let's try and do it evenly. The, the girl here with the flowers on the top, can you come out to the front, please? Um, yes, you can be one of them too. Yes, sir, at the back in the black top, would you like to come down at the front? How many is that? Three. Um, and the girl there, yes, you, would you please come down to the front? That's four. Uh, okay, and yes, uh, you please there. And uh, I think we need one more. How are we doing? We've got four, five. Oh, 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 oh. Boy in blue there, yes, please. Would you like to come down too? Excellent. What are your names? Edward. Edward. Poppy. Poppy. Bob. Bob. Ved. Ved. Charlotte. Charlotte and Joe. Joe. Excellent. Thank you for coming to join us. Please. <laughs> They're quite right to give you all a clap because you're very brave to come down here given what's inside the bin. Right, now, I require you please to stand in a line um, you can come back a bit on stage here, under these stockings. Don't worry, things won't fall out on your head. So stand about there, and each of you is going to be a tradesperson. So I think you can be a road mender, and you can be a manure manufacturer. <laughs> Chosen at random. And, oh, and you can be a paper manufacturer. That's also a bit of a smelly job, so don't get too cheery. <laughs> uh, and you can be a, a, a shop... Oh, is that, how's, is that OK? A shopkeeper, yeah. right? Yeah, shopkeeper. And you can be a scrap metal dealer. And you, sir, Edward, is it Edward? Yes. Oh, good. You can be a Prussian blue manufacturer. And I should just explain that Prussian blue was a kind of blue dye that they used to make pigments and paints in Victorian times. Prussian blue. So we have a Prussian blue manufacturer, scrap metal dealer, shopkeeper, paper maker, man manure manufacturer, and road mender. Um, you also probably need some hats to make it look a bit more Victorian, so see if those fit. If they don't fit, don't worry, because people in Victorian times wore hats that didn't fit. Um, they couldn't afford hats that fitted, you know. Try that one. If they don't, you can always try swapping them around a bit, you know. Oh, well, you might like to swap with someone else there. And, of course, because you're trades... Thank you for being very patient there, Jamie. Thank you very much. Uh, I suppose you're probably anticipating what's in the dustbin. 
because you're tradespeople, of course, you also need some money. So in these bags, I have some genuine Victorian coins. What you mustn't do is eat them before the experiment is over, um, because you don't want to eat coins. They leave a nasty, coppery taste in the mouth. So just hold on to those. Uh, you may also be required to part with some of them, of course. So hold on to that there. Very good. Thank you very much. Now, as I said, we are going to find out what the Victorians threw away and how they reused some of those items. And hopefully by the end of it, Edward, oh, Jamie, apologies, Jamie will have found in, in enough bits and pieces to sell to buy himself a Christmas dinner. What do you want for Christmas dinner, Jamie? Sorry? I have no idea. You have no idea what you want for Christmas dinner. Well, let's see how much you can find uh, in the dustbin. Okay, so what, are you, what I'd like you to do is pull out one item at a time and then try to guess, with a bit of help from the audience potentially, try to guess which tradesperson you can sell it to. There's lots of ash in there, so you'll have to rummage a bit. But uh, do feel free. You can pull some of the ash out and toss it around if you want. Oh, ooh, ooh. Trust you to go and find the rotten fish. Okay, can you hold that up so the audience can see the rot rotten fish? Thank you, the sort of thing you might get in a dustbin. Now, which of these tradespeople might want a rotten fish? Any guesses? The paper maker using dead fish to make paper. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Any other guesses? It could always do ask the audience. The manure manufacturer, yes, congratulations, the manure manufacturer. <laughs> now, you're being a very good manure manufacturer there. Uh, if you want to buy his rotten fish, you will need to give him a single one of your coins, please. So would you like to engage in the transaction? <laughs> Excellent. So you can go back to the dustbin now, take your rotten fish and make some manure with it. Okay, now have another rummage, please. Oh, excellent. You found an old cake tin. Now, uh, Jamie, who might like an old cake tin? Some of the audience wants an old cake tin. The scrap metal dealer is absolutely right. Well done. Yes, please. Okay. It may be that the scrap metal dealer can all do all sorts of things with that old cake tin. Now, you've got two coins that's halfway towards maybe a Brussels sprout or two, but I think you need to dig a bit deeper. So go rummaging in there. Edward. What happens if we don't want to buy it? <laughs> well, I guess you get to keep your chocolate coin. <laughs> Is that what you were thinking? Oh, he's found an old boot. Can I trade back? <laughs> well... You can negotiate that after the experiment. <laughs> so he's found an old boot. Now, who might want an old boot? This is a little bit trickier, this one. Who might want an old boot? Really? Now, the thing is, Mr. Prussian Blue Manufacturer, if someone brings you an old boot and you've got money, you're supposed to give them a coin for it if that's what they want. <laughs> Don't worry, you'll get chocolate at the end of it. So... <laughs> So, who are you going to sell the old boot to? Alas, no, the shopkeeper will not buy boots unless they're in pairs. Who else might want an old boot? Prussian blue manufacturer, absolutely. You're very good, give him a coin. <laughs> Now, in Victorian times, boots were ground down to make Prussian blue. They had a use for everything. Have another rummage in there. You can pull some of that ash out if you want, if it helps you get further down. Oh, now that's interesting. Can you hold that up to the audience? Is there anything inside it? Oh, it's got a steam train on it, look. Oh, uh, it's a ginger beer bottle. Okay, a ginger beer bottle. Victorian ginger beer bottle. Um, who might want that? 
Not the manure manufacturer. Shopkeeper, yes, I think the shopkeeper will take that one. Now, in Victorian times, bottles were returnable. They had the name of the company on, so you could take them back to the shop, and you would get a quarter of a penny. Now, it, might so it might not sound very much, but a quarter of a penny in Victorian times would buy you a slice of bread and a cup of tea. So that's a start, isn't it, on that Christmas dinner? So bottles were returnable. OK, well, we're getting there. Have another rummage. Oh, what's the, is that toilet paper? No. Oh, intestine. Oh, oh, no. Oh no, hold on. Let's have a look. No, what, are they rags? Are they? Yeah. I think I think these are these are rags. Okay, it's it's nothing nasty. It's rags. Now, which of these tradespeople might want some rags? Oh, you do know your Victorian recycling. Excellent. Paper maker. Yes, paper maker. Because in Victorian times, rags were boiled down to make paper. Now, we still need something for the road mender. And that's, well, you've all got something else. There's a couple more things in there. Have a, have a rummage deep down. Put all this stuff out on top. Let's get this. See, see what, what's that? Oh, bone. a bone. OK, it's a bit smelly. Haven't got a dog. So who might want the bone? Paper maker. Oh, bone paper. Bone maker? Manure. You think the ma Yes, you're absolutely right. It's the manure manufacturer. Bones will be taken to the manure manufacturer. And the bones which weren't taken to the manure manufacturer will be scavenged by the dogs on the dust yard. So there's always a use for everything. It looks like quite a chewy bone. Um, you've already paid him, so you don't have to give him another one if you don't want to. But fine. Keep rummaging. There's a couple more items in there, I believe. Could he pull that one out? That's a bit heavy, isn't it? A brick. Ah, a brick. Brick. Is that just because it's a process of elimination? You into bricks? You fancy a brick? Okay, he'll have it, he'll have it. Anything like bricks or rubble or large lumps of coal or broken crockery could be sold to road menders to fill in holes and to make up pathways in Victorian times. Farmers would cast away large quantities of this material from the dust yards and they would pay to do so. So everything had a value. Excellent. Now there's one more thing in there. Have a rummage and see if you can find it. Oh, that's unusual. What is inside? I think we might need to cut back to my screen at this moment. It looks like a bottle with a marble inside it. Now, this is a very special sort of bottle, which is used in Victorian times. And I was going to ask, does anyone know why there's a marble inside it? And I think the young lady here does know. It certainly does fizz up. Have you drunk from one of these today? Yes, they still have these bottles today, J Japanese bottles with marbles inside. Has anyone drunk from a bottle with a marble inside? Yeah, one or two of you know these things. Well, these are invented by the Victorians, the mystery object, the bottle with the marble inside. And the Victorians had a bit of a difficulty when it came to fizzy drinks. Normally, they would seal their bottles with corks, and the bottle would stand with the cork. But after a while, the cork would begin to dry out, and all the fizz would escape from the lemonade, and it would go flat. And so in the year 1872, a man called Hiram Codd invented the Codd bottle with the marble in. And the marble was the stopper of the bottle, and it would be wedged against the rubber ring. And in order to open the bottle, you would push it down inside, and then it would get stuck. But sometimes, in Victorian times, children would break these bottles to get the marbles out. Now. Now, that's your last item there. Who do you think might want that? The shopkeeper, yes. So please give it to the shopkeeper. <laughs> Who will return it to the shop and refill it so it can be used again and again. 
Now, let's see how many coins you have. Oh, you've got enough there for Christmas dinner. Excellent. And you've all got some coins left over. Please give all our volunteers a round of applause. Thank you all very much. Can we have our chocolate coins back? Well, ask Emily about that one. Uh, so if you could take your caps off and your signs, and uh, you can leave your rubbish where it is. I don't, don't imagine you want that. <laughs> you need to ask Emily about that one. I knew the chocolate coins would be a little bit controversial. So there you are. You can all go and have a nice Christmas dinner. Excellent. <laughs> now, we're in the year 1866, you'll remember. And in 1866, they were very good at reusing and recycling everything they could find. But eventually, the Victorians generated so much rubbish that they simply had to bury it in the ground. And this is where I come in. Because as well as being a historian, I am an archaeologist. My job is to dig up rubbish. And I dig up Victorian rubbish and use it to teach people about Victorian everyday life. This is what it looks like. It's usually just rubbish dumped in a hole in the ground. And we run community digs, such as this one. This was last year in Dis, where we ran a big dig in March, and we got children involved from Dis High School, supervised by members of the Waveney Valley Archaeology uh, Group. And here you can see they're digging a trench to find some Victorian rubbish. And the things we use when we're digging, we use a trowel to scrape away the earth gently so that we don't break anything, and we use a sieve so we can sieve the soil to find small items which might be preserved in it. And sometimes we find little time capsules. This is the bottom of a rusted old bucket which had been thrown away with all the rubbish inside it. It's probably about one week's worth of rubbish. And what you can see poking out of the soil there is a beer bottle. There's two beer bottles, actually. A pudding bowl a rusted old tin inside the pudding bowl, and there's the bottom of a medicine bottle. And there would have been things like rags and paper too, but that all tends to rot away over the years so that you're left with only the hard stuff that survives. And when you find a little time capsule like this, you scrape away gently and record everything in its place, and then you know exactly what that Victorian family had to eat for that week. Has anyone here found little bits of Victorian china and glass in their back garden or when they're walking around the fields? You have, sir. Yes, some of you, quite a few of you. Well, when you were finding those things, which were probably put there by the Victorians, you were being archaeologists. You were picking up old bits of rubbish and washing it and looking at it and trying to use it to learn about the past. Here is a, an assemblage of rubbish from a rectory at a place called Brockdish, near Dis, which was thrown away about the year 1866. And it gives you an idea of the sorts of things we find which survive in the ground. Broken plates, of course, because the Victorians broke lots of their crockery. Lots of broken bottles. They're usually broken because they took the intact bottles back to the shop, with one or two exceptions. And even some bits of food waste. But occasionally we find a few more interesting things. Now here we have a few items which can tell us about Victorian childhood at Christmas time. And this is where I need a little bit of technology that they didn't have in Victorian times. But I hope you'll, you'll forget about that. Brilliant. So who can see the alphabet cups? Whereabouts are they? Here? Here? Yeah, OK, good. These are alphabet cups. These are fragments of alphabet cups. And in Victorian times, young children were taught to read at home by having the cups with the letters on before they went to school. Who can spot some nursery rhyme cups? Yes? Yes, absolutely right. Those two at the top, they are nursery rhyme cups with verses from the popular Victorian nursery rhyme, This is the house that Jack built. And there you can see, this is the dog that chased the rat that caught the... 
This is the dog that chased the cat, that caught the rat, that ate the malt, that lived in the house that Jack built. And each one of these nursery rhyme cups had a different verse, and those were the nursery rhymes the children would have learnt at home. Now, we don't know the names of the children who threw these cups away, but we do know what nursery rhymes they learnt. Who can spot two toy cockerels? Yes? Yes, two toy cockerels, farmyard birds, of course, and these I dug up behind an old farmyard. So the children were playing with little toy animals, like the animals they knew in the farmyard. And who can spot a child's thimble? Here? Yes, that suggests that there was a little girl making embroidery, and we know that little girls would engage in making sample, as they were called, with their name on them and date, and sometimes flowers and animals. And finally, who can spot a tiny doll wrapped in copper wire? Yes, in the middle there. Now, one bright person down here earlier said that those frozen charlottes, or maybe someone up there, said that those frozen charlottes were used on Christmas trees. Who said that? You at the back, yes. Frozen charlottes used on Christmas trees. Well, this is a frozen charlotte. And I wondered when I dug her up with my trowel why she had copper wire wrapped around her. And then I realised that the rubbish around her looked like Christmas rubbish. And she was probably a decoration for the top of a Christmas tree. Now... We find quite a few dolls in Victorian rubbish dumps. Don't be alarmed, I know it's a little bit scary, but sometimes they break and I try my best to glue them back together again. The heads are usually all that's left because the fabric body rots away. But they give us an insight into the sorts of toys that Victorian children had in their stockings in the late 19th century. We also find these. Now, these are very tiny cups and plates. Why are, they, why are they so tiny? Is it because the Victorians are much smaller than we are? Yes. Doll's House Crockery. Very good. Yes, you're on the ball. Doll's House Crockery. These are coming from Victorian dolls' tea sets. And we know that the Victorians like to have tea with their dolls. Here is a late Victorian photograph illustrating uh, exactly that. Uh, one of them's a girl, one of them's a doll. <laughs> Just in case you're not sure. We also find these. Now, does anyone know what these are? Yes. Dominoes, absolutely right. Does anyone here still play with dominoes? Great. Does anyone here ever eat pizza from dominoes? <laughs> okay. I know that's a bit confusing. Well, we sometimes find dominoes. And we also find these. Who knows what these are? Mar marbles, yes. I think a few of you have said marbles. We find Victorian marbles too. And we know that at Christmas time, the Victorians would have these boxes of games that they would bring out. And this, I, I, I hunted high and low to find this. This is a genuine Victorian box of games from about the year 1866. And it contains, as you can see, chess pieces, dominoes, marbles, tiddlywinks, and all sorts of other bits and pieces. So we get little snippets, little insights into what Victorian children were playing with at Christmas time. There are some Victorian children playing with some rather large dominoes. And after they'd been eating all that Christmas cake, the Victorians were very keen on dental hygiene, and they made sure that they brushed their teeth. This is a genuine Victorian lid from a pot of toothpaste showing the head of Queen Victoria. And we read that this is cherry toothpaste for beautifying and preserving teeth and gums. Do you know who invented toothpaste? No? Was it the Victorians? The Americans? Well, it might have been, actually. Do you know, sir? It was an American man. Do you know his name? He is gunpowder. <laughs> no, I don't know who actually invented it. I wanted you to say it was the Victorians who invented it, of course. It might have been an American Victorian, but he knows more than I do about that. And if you've got toothpaste, you also need toothbrushes, another thing popularised by the Victorians. And we're getting near 
the end of the lecture now. But I just want to ask, does anybody know what these are? Yes. Clay pipes. Very good. Has anyone found a clay pipe? Oh, I'm impressed. What, in the garden? Or you find bits of them? They are like the cigarette ends of the Victorian times. People would smoke these clay pipes, which wasn't very good for their teeth or health generally, but they didn't know that. And they would smoke these clay pipes. And when we dig through layers of rubbish, we find quite a lot of clay pipes. And occasionally, we find a very special clay pipe. Now, in fact, I have a tray of items down with me here, which some of you can look at afterwards. And I believe I have this very clay pipe here on stage. It's got holly and berries all over it, and on the bottom there's a man with a hat and a big beard. I don't know who that is. Any guesses? <laughs> yes. Santa Claus, absolutely. This could be Father Christmas's own clay pipe. So there it is, more proof of the existence of Father Christmas. And we find things like this boot. Sometimes when other things have rotted away, if the soil conditions are right, we find things that aren't normally preserved, like items of leather and items of fabric. And this is an old boot which I dug up from a very, very deep layer. And we also find lots of buttons. Now, my last question to everybody, and it's a question I always ask, given that the Victorians were so good at reusing and recycling things, is why did the Victorians throw away something as useful as buttons? Does anyone have a guess? Because I'm not really sure. Yes? So when they ironed the clothes, they took the buttons off, and maybe they dropped the buttons on the floor, and the buttons got swept up with the dust and thrown away. That's possible. I'm sure some of these got into the rubbish by, by that means. Yes, in the blue. So the Victorians are working very hard and they're wearing the rags and they're rummaging through the dustbins and their buttons might fall off into the dust. I'm sure that's right, yes. Any other reasons they might? Yes. They, they, uh, they lost them. Yes, I'm sure some of them got lost, dropped on the floor and swept up. Someone over at the back there with your hand up. Yes, you, sir. Oh, so if the house had a fire and they didn't have time to save everything and the buttons. Yes, these are all great ideas. And there are other reasons too. Yes, you're very keen. What's your idea? Yeah. Cheap to make. And actually, that's very true. Buttons were very cheap to make. But I think... Okay, yes. Now, this is, this is great. Uh, you're absolutely right. They, they lost their clothes, or they threw their old clothes away sometimes, and the buttons were attached to the clothes. So the clothes rot away in the ground, but you're left with the buttons. And these buttons are made of things like wood and bone and china and mother of pearl. All these sorts of things last in the ground. Well, I've been having so much fun in the year... 1866, I've hardly had a chance to glance at my watch, and I realise now that we are at the end of our lecture, and it's almost time for us to return to the present. I hope you've enjoyed this journey back in time, and I hope you've had a sense of all the things that we have in common with the Victorians, and all the things that we have inherited from the Victorians. Just as in Victorian times, in parts of the world today, there are children who have to go rummaging through rubbish to make a living for themselves. And just as in Victorian times, we tend to throw away quite a few things, particularly at Christmas time. Just think of all that wrapping paper. Well, goodbye, everybody. It's been an honour to take you on this trip back in time. Do make sure you remember those... Victorian Chris Christmas children, and above all, a Merry Christmas to you all, one and all. <laughs>